Hi. Thank you all for joining today's WCET and Blackboard webinar, What the Election Results Mean for Higher Education. While we can't say exactly what will happen under the new administration, we will discuss areas to watch and who the new players are. Today's webinar is moderated by Van Davis, Associate Vice President in Higher Education Policy and Research at Blackboard. Our speakers are Jarrett Cummings, Director of Policy and Government Relations at Educause, Leah Matthews, Executive Director at Distance Education Accrediting Commission, and Russ Poulin, Director of Policy and Analysis at WCET. This webinar will be recorded and available on demand after today's session. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A box found at the bottom of the screen. Suggestions for further reading are listed at the end of the webinar. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Van. Thank you again and enjoy today's session. Well, good afternoon, folks. It is a pleasure to be here with you today and especially to uh, be here with our esteemed panelists. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive today on three primary areas that we think are going to be impacted uh, by the 2016 presidential and congressional elections. Uh, regulations and reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, accreditation and quality assurance, and affordability and technology. Um, and so what we'll do first is do a little bit of uh, setting the stage just to make sure we all sort of know where we're going and see what does it look like we're going to face in January of 2017. Well, the first piece is to look at where Congress stands. Uh, in our current session, 114th session on the Senate side, we've got a breakdown in the parties of 54 Republicans, 44 Democrats, and two independents, which fairly consistently vote with the Democrats. And then on the House side, it breaks down to 246 Republicans, 187 Democrats, and one vacant seat. And when we look at how that compares to what we'll have with the 115th Congress, we really don't see that much of a difference. Uh, we see a small gain in both the House and the Senate for Democrats, although it's not enough to really shift the power. There are two races that are still um, yet to be determined, one in the Senate uh, and one in the House. Those are Louisiana races. But what's interesting here is when we look at, especially on the Senate, how close really the breakdown of parties is, it raises a lot of very interesting opportunities for what we might see in the way of filibustering around educational legislation and other types of legislation moving forward. And then when we look at who the congressional players are, we're not seeing much of a change. Probably the biggest Somewhat of a change as Virginia Fox will be coming in as the uh, chair for the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. She's been serving on that committee. She was in charge of the Higher Education Subcommittee. I know Russ and Jared are going to have some things to say about what she might be interested in doing now, taking over that entire committee. And then on the Senate side, we see no change whatsoever. Lamar Alexander from Tennessee will continue to be the chair of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and Patty Murray will continue to be the ranking member there. We actually had this morning uh, the ranking member announced on the House side, and that's going to be Bobby Scott, Democrat of Virginia. Again, he's been on this committee, so there's not really any significant change there. The biggest change, of course, is going to be on the executive side. We have uh, President-elect Donald Trump, who said very little about higher education on the campaign trail. In fact, the only really specific higher education policy that was discussed uh, was around uh, loan repayment and forgiveness. And then probably the, one of the bigger unknowns in all of this is our nominee for Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, uh, who comes from the American Federation for Children. Uh, she has no higher education experience. That's not necessarily that unusual uh, when we look at Secretary of Education. Uh, but we don't yet know who we're looking at as the undersecretary. So some business as usual, perhaps, uh, on the House and the Senate side, at least in terms of the players. Certainly a lot of change on the executive side. 
And with that in mind, I'm going to ask Russ to open up our conversation and ask him, we've seen a lot of regulatory activity over the last couple of years. State authorization, teacher preparation, borrower defense, gainful employment, regular and substantive interaction. Let's have you start us off, Russ, by talking about what you think is going to happen in 2017. And do we ever think that the Higher Education Act is going to get authorized? Van, thank you so much for the introduction and the background background on this. Uh, let's see, if you could go back to the last last picture there. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for all of this, and we are very uh, happy to uh, be working with Blackboard again in terms of providing providing this information. Uh, again, I'm Russ Poulin, Director of Policy Analysis with WCT, uh, which is Cooperative for Educational Technologies, and uh, we uh, especially are interested in all the uh, policy issues at the federal, state, and and uh, institutional level. And the reason I had him go back is that for those of you who have seen my picture before, I put a different picture in this one, uh, one because I now have a beard, and so people uh, ask me about that. The other is is that if you've seen my pictures in my blog posts, I often carry a bat, and I'm carrying a much smaller bat uh, in this in, in this one, and this is what's happening with, with, uh, with, with regulations, is that uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, regulations are going to be uh, less of an issue this time. So if we move to the next, uh, move to the next slide, uh, that in response to an, in an inside higher ed uh, uh, interview uh, with the incoming chair of the uh, House Committee on Education and Workforce, that uh, the question was, what approach will Republicans take to the higher education regulations released by the department under the leadership of John King? And this was the answer, is that we'll do everything that to roll these back. Uh, today, I was watching the Today Show where Trump was announced as the uh, uh, person of the year, and uh, one of his comments is we're going to get rid of 90 to 95 percent of regulations. And so, um, for uh, either for uh, Representative Fox or Chairwoman Fox now, that uh, or for Trump, that these are not uh, uh, not surprising things for us to hear from them. However, some will be easy to remove and some will be much harder for them to remove. So let's move to the uh, to the next slide and then look at some things that, that they can do. And there's going to be a lot of looking at this, uh, it says there, this obscure law, this Congressional Review Act. And it's something that, that came about uh, uh, back in the, uh, in the uh, Newt Gingrich days, back in uh, the Clinton administration at this if this came about, and it's something where uh, Congress is allowed to review uh, any regulation issued in the last 60 days uh, of a year. However, that is congressional days. So congressional days is how many days that the House or Senate uh, has met. So this takes us back to May 30th of 2016 is the, is the current feeling about how far this will go back. It could change depending on when they uh, adjourn this year. Uh, but we're looking back to any regulations that were uh, were issued in the last uh, half of the year or a little bit more of last year uh, could be subject to this act. Um, it is on this, reg this uh, law, this Congressional Review Act, has only been used once ever. Uh, it was used on an ergonomics bill, uh, ergonomics regulations that were put out by the Clinton administration and were squashed by the incoming uh, Bush administration. And it's very rare that it gets used because you, you think about it that if it's used in the middle of a uh, presidential uh, term that the, the president and the legislature and you know, and all the, all the powers that be that brought that regulation into, into being uh, would not use it. But we're at the perfect spot here where we're moving from one administration to another, there's a lot of regulations coming out at the end of uh, the term of one president, and the new president wants to try to get rid of them. And so this could be used uh, quite a bit. There's very little judicial history on this uh, 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 on this uh, 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 regulation because it's only been used once. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens in terms of uh, this all going to court and whether any of this is legal. And there's also one other really interesting thing uh, about it that says if a regulation is killed by this Congressional Review Act, 
uh, by their using it, that it cannot be introduced. Uh, they cannot introduce the department uh, that introduced that rule cannot reintroduce a similar rule without additional legislation. And so, and there's some idea, there's some question about how that is interpreted as well. And so let's look here. We have this uh, little chart here that there are some things that came out since May that are subject to the Congressional Review Act. Um, teacher prep regulations were uh, in the comments were very unpopular. Uh, I, I don't think that they, for those of us in a distance ed world, I don't think they did us uh, um, any favors and, and really called out distance ed uh, very, very, very separately um, with that. There was uh, regulations about that are called the Bauer Defense Act, and this had to do. This came as a result of uh, several of the closures of uh, for-profit institutions, and uh, not only, but it defined what would happen in terms of uh, closing institutions, but also um, had a lot to do with uh, um, uh, uh, misrepresentation and what, what that, how that would be defined. Uh, overtime rules, you probably heard about that, that those are now in, in limbo in the courts as well as subject to this. And then one other one I meant to put in there is, uh, has to do with uh, cash management, and this had to do with um, the type of credit cards that uh, institutions could issue uh, to students for their refunds of federal financial aid. And so all of those could uh, be subject uh, to Congressional Review Act could probably go away uh, fairly easily. Uh, another one I have down there is state authorization. This is a one I have it in italics because it's uh, not yet been uh, introduced. The final rule has not been introduced. I suspect that they will release this, but uh, there's part of me that makes me think that if that whole provision about they cannot reduce, cannot reintroduce similar. Uh, or similar rule might make them think about holding back on that. So we'll we'll see what happens with that, but it could be put aside. But do remember that that's just the federal rule, and even if it is does go away, that every state still expects you to meet their rules. Uh, uh, some others there that you see that are not uh, subject to Congressional Review Act, what happens then? What they have to do with that, you know, rather than just a bill that's passed by both houses to get rid of the regulation, if there are those older rules, like gainful employment, that what will ha have to happen is uh, they'll have to go through the whole same procedure of set that they use to create the rules, which is there's several steps to that, and it will take quite a while. So they can't just throw some of these things out um, immediately. Let's move to the next slide on this. So I hope I didn't confuse everybody with that, but you can see that uh, some rules will be hard and some will be easier. I'll just briefly, I'll do a few things about the higher education uh, reauthorization uh, of the Higher Education Act. That this is a, an act that is uh, started in 1965, and it's the act that contains most of the rules around uh, federal financial aid. And they intend to uh, redo it every five years or so. We are now uh, eight years out since the last time it was uh, redone. Uh, there's certainly interest in uh, both of the senators that you see there about working together. Uh, that That is one thing that uh, has been a hallmark of uh, both Alexander and Murray in terms of trying to work together to uh, make something that works for all. Uh, certainly, Senator Alexander is uh, for reduced regulation on this. And the thinking right now is that this probably won't happen until uh, 2018. However, with some of the things that we'll be talking later on today, I expect uh, to see some one-off bills, and meaning that uh, there'll be some things where there'll be uh, interest to try to get rid of some regulations. There'll be some uh, um, interest in trying to do uh, more to provide relief for for-profit institutions that came under uh, uh, attack. There'll be some uh, interest in changing some of the financial aid rules. Um, and even though Senator Alexander would like to keep these all together, I think the pressures will be too great uh, that there'll be some of these things that will um, get traction. Uh, Jarrett will speak uh, a little bit later about some of the specifics, but I'll stop there and just see real quickly if there's any comments from the others. So, Leah, I know that you had some um, things that you wanted to throw into the mix here, especially around state authorization. Do you want to start us off here? Oh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, 
Well, I, I've had the privilege of working closely with Russ um, for well over a year now um, on the state authorization rules and how institutions have been preparing to comply with them, whether through SARA, um, as a SARA member, um, having state authorization requirements met um, in that membership, or whether pursuit of state authorization requirements um, individually for states where students are enrolled. Um, I think it's important for institutions to understand that even if federal rules for state authorization and eligibility for financial aid don't go into effect, states will still have their rules for authorization. And so it, it remains important to stay tuned in to what states are doing with their rules on state authorization for distance education and uh, what organizations like WCET and also SARA um, are producing in terms of information about state authorization and as states join SARA, it continues to be a viable organization and means for distance education institutions to um, make sure that they have compliance and state authorization in states where they enroll students. And I know um, either Leah or Russ or, or Jarrett, uh, we've got a couple of questions here I want to touch on real quickly before we move on. Uh, we've got a question from New York University that's really curious about uh, whether or not we think around uh, state authorization, if federal regulations go away, do either, do any of the three of you think that we're going to see an increase or a decrease or sort of maintaining the status quo? in terms of what states are doing around distance ed authorization? Well, this is Russ. I think we've already seen an increase from the from states uh, on two folds. One is that back when the original regulation was released in 2010, there was something like 10 states that if all you did in the state was offer distance education, that they regulated you. Uh, they may have regulated you if you did other things face-to-face -face and all that sort of thing, but if all you did was, face to, uh, was uh, distance ed that they regulated you. We're now up to something like 24 states, you know, so that's only in uh, since 2010. Uh, so more and more states are starting to see that there is a uh, uh, that loophole that they had or the, the, that, that was those students were not covered so that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. The other is that uh, there's been increased uh, uh, interest on this and that uh, some uh, attorneys general have found that uh, this is a uh, an issue that they can get some some traction on, and so remember, AG also stands for aspiring governor. Uh, so uh, that some of them have gone after some institutions. And that's what I've seen. I would also add to what Russ said that um, some of the profession licensure bodies um, are showing a growing interest in state authorization for distance education programs that prepare students and then graduates for specific professions. That There's an interest in state authorization of a program um, that's preparing for a specific license and whether there is proper authority to operate in a state and thereby be eligible for a state licensure exam. So again, regardless of where this goes at a, a federal policy level, it, it's something that's in the ether for higher education and I believe it's here to stay. Thanks a lot. Um, anything else you guys want to uh, add to the mix here on what we think may be happening with the regulatory environment and a higher education reauthorization at some point in the next one, two, three, four years. Well, Van, this is Jared. I, I just wanted to uh, reinforce something uh, that Russ mentioned in terms of uh, the possibility that uh, uh, formal reauthorization could be delayed into 2018. I think um, part of that stems from the, the workload the Senate is going to face uh, just in terms of uh, dealing with uh, Trump administration cabinet appointees and, and departmental appointees, as well as the general congressional workload around some of the, the major priorities that, that the Trump administration is, is putting forward now in terms of immigration and tax reform and so forth. Um, another interesting thing to consider is that um, the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act under uh, Senators Alexander and Murray 
uh, was quite a feat um, and it was quite unexpected when it happened at the end of 20, 2015. Um, and that was intended to clear, in part, to clear the way for Higher Education Act reauthorization. Um, with the appointment of a Secretary of Education who's interested in revisiting uh, some of the major issues around federal funding for K through 12 uh, institutions, uh, whether that be through vouchers or uh, supporting the development of charter schools, that could bring elementary and secondary policy back onto the stage and make it even further uh, crowded uh, in terms of trying to address higher education issues. Thanks a lot there, Jarrett. So why don't we move on, because we've already started, I think, to uh, touch on this when we were talking a little bit about what we might see around licensure and things like that, uh, with accreditation and quality assurance. And, you know, this is a perennial topic of conversation over the last several years, looking at the role that accreditation plays in general, but specifically looking at it in terms of consumer protection, quality assurance, mm -hmm. financial aid. Most recently, the conversations around what's going to happen with ACICS. Uh, so what do we think is going to happen with accreditors and accreditation in 2017? And, and Leah, um, let's have you start us off here, please. Sure. Um, I've been in the field of accreditation for 18 years, and for, for many of these years, I've spoken on panels at various various conferences, um, and typically attendance was pretty low at a panel breakout session on accreditation, but the last three years, uh, these sessions have been standing room only, and it signals to me that there is a growing interest in how accreditation is being treated and how it's going to have a different role in the future. Um, by way of background, um, accreditation is broken. Um, that has been a federal government mantra for several years now. Um, whether U.S. Congress um, Democrats or Republicans or the executive branch, um, the message about perceived deficiencies about accreditation has been driving this push for greater government oversight, um, whether delivered from Secretary of Education, who has described accreditation as watchdogs that don't bite, um, an undersecretary once called accreditation um, as being asleep at the switch. Senators um, have plenty of criticism about accreditation, and um, there's lots of calls for change in how accreditation operates. One of the most significant changes I've seen for accreditation, particularly in the 2015-2016 year, is this growing consensus that accreditation must play a stronger consumer protection role. And where accreditation typically has been focused on quality review, peer review, improvement of institutions, um, the calls for consumer protection functioning um, has really become marshaled in all aspects of government, whether Congress, states, uh, the administration. So I, I think that we're going to see this direction continue. Um, even within a Trump administration, uh, it's been very, very clear that accreditation has got to have strengthened accountability measures. And we've seen the government play a more prominent role in accreditation through the National Advisory uh, Committee for Institutional Quality and Integrity, also known as NASIKI. Uh, the NASIKI group has been very, very clear that because of importance to the public and protecting students, um, all accreditation activities have to come under more intensified scrutiny by that committee and by other regulatory bodies as well. And so how is accreditation going to do this? Um, accreditation is being called on to look more closely at metrics. Um, there's a sense of real urgency surrounding this need for some individual economic and social well-being um, data as well as competitiveness. Um, and at the same time, you know, student loan debt is now totaling more than $1.3 trillion. Um, some of the loan averages to complete a bachelor's degree is upwards around $37,000. And so in this environment, you know, regulators and the public want accreditation 
um, to focus more intently on students gaining a quality education at a manageable financial level. Um, so now that accreditation is m talked about more and more, um, we've seen metrics be produced. Uh, we saw an array of institution graduation rates um, by a creditor uh, be published on the Department of Education's website. Uh, we recently saw the gainful employment statistics uh, first start to come out on what the earnings of graduates are uh, based on the degree programs that they completed. And all of these other data, sor data sources, um, such as College Scorecard or College Navigator, um, Education Trust College results online, um, are available for use by students. And these databases are starting to tie institution performance back to accreditation. So unless accreditation takes more seriously this kind of public accountability role, um, I think accreditation has a, a real risk of being kind of written out of the equation for the Department of Education and its gatekeeping function. And I think that's a real important uh, thing to understand right now, um, that accreditation more than ever has to strike a balance between its traditional roles over 100 years of peer review focused education quality and improvement with um, delivering accountability based on metrics, you know, graduation rates, employment data, uh, ability to pay off loan debt. Um, I think we're going to continue to see that as um, a real important aspect for accreditation. Now, does this mean that students are going to be better served? Um, I don't know. But I think that it's um, still uh, incumbent upon accreditation to you know, look deeply at how it assesses quality and how it uses data and how it um, helps institutions uh, promote student achievement and, and to the public. And so going forward, we're likely going to see more scrutiny of accreditation, um, even under a, a different uh, administration. So that uh, kind of concludes my quick overview, and I'm trying to be sensitive to the, the time that we have together on the call. So I'm happy to take some questions or um, turn it over to our other distinguished panelists for other commentary. Well, we've got a couple of quick questions here about accreditation that I want to make sure that we get, use, that we, uh, get to. Uh, and one of them actually has to do with something that's happening uh, very, very recently, ACICS you know, just was approved by CHIA for three more years. Do we think that this is any sort of harbinger of things to come? Uh, are they going to weather the storm? Are we going to see uh, CHIA be able to play a larger role? Um, or do we think that we're going to still see the department uh, taking a look at accreditors and, and mm -hmm. in the move towards accountability saying we're not going to recognize you anymore. Well, what I understand about the, the CHIA recommendation is that that's by the Committee on Recommendation, um, that the recommendation for an additional three years would still need to go before the CHIA Board of Directors um, at their upcoming meeting. Um, so, But until that decision is finalized, I think it's an important signal that the academic community and the higher ed community um, supports accreditation. And, you know, CHIA's role is different from that of the government. You know, CHIA's role is a community of educators that um, sets expectations for accreditation and, and how accreditors meet those expectations. So I think it, it's a, an important moment for ACICS. Uh, it's still waiting to hear from Secretary King on their appeal of the senior department officials' decision to uphold Nasiki's denial of their recognition. Uh, but I, I wonder uh, if ACICS um, gets a decision from Secretary King and they fight it in court with an injunctive relief, um, will the Trump administration have any interest in pursuing a fight that the Obama administration started basically with ACICS? So I think there's a real curiosity into how the next administration handles a, a potential lawsuit um, over decisions made by a completely different administration. And we'll just have to wait and see.
What happened? I want to throw this. <laughs> I want to throw this next question open to all three of our panelists uh, because I think that it, it transcends perhaps accreditation and everything else. Um, there's a lot of conversations about institutional uh, specific metrics and a lot of conversations about how we define quality and how do we take into consideration uh, an institution's specific student population and how they might or might not perform uh, relative to a bright line uh, measure. Do any of you have a sense moving forward uh, to the ex the, about the extent to which there will be in all of these conversations some recognition that there's a lot of differences out there in terms of institutions working with specific student groups and how that might or might not uh, perfect uh, impact performance measures. Well, this is Russ. Let me let me try one that's coming out of the Department of Education and the uh, the IPEDS. That's the the uh, higher ed surveys that are done every year. Uh, they've had the graduation rate uh, for a long time, which has been based only on cohorts of first time full time students. Well, if you're a community college or an adult focused institution. Uh, that you you rate horribly on that graduation rate measure. They are supposed to release, I believe it's still this year, it might be next year, uh, a new set of uh, things that they're calling outcomes measures. I wish they would just uh, call it more graduation rate or something better. That will take into account uh, uh, several uh, different paths for students. It will take into account uh, transfers. It will take into account uh, part-time students, and so that they'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they play that and how it comes out. But at least, uh, and I know that there is alternative uh, groups, the, the SAM group that are working on a, on a similar thing like this. But we, we really, that's one bright line measure that we really need to get fixed. And I'm glad to say at least there's some work on that. I, I would say that trying to establish, you know, bright line benchmarks is incredibly difficult. Um, because we have institutions and programs with students in lots of different places in their learning. Um, the growing emphasis on competency-based education where students work at their own flexible paces also makes it more difficult to, to try to get a handle on what cohorts are and how to align student achievement data across cohorts um, and, and draw comparisons uh, of institution performance. And um, you know, there certainly are lots of attempts to try to streamline how we collect data and look at it, but I think it's very important to focus on institution mission and uh, individualized uh, student uh, progress, whether they're transferring, bringing prior learning. Um, th there's lots of different ways that student progress um, it can be measured. And um, sometimes I feel frustrated by an emphasis on some kind of bright line measure that uh, could be a one-size-fits-all because it, it really simply can't be. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jared, is there anything here that you'd like to weigh in on? Well, I would just say I, I think that most of the conversation that I've observed around accreditation has been more focused on um, addressing differences in types of providers and, and modes of education as opposed to uh, different student populations. And so that's a, a little bit of a different wrinkle, but I think similar it presents similar challenges in that, um, you know, we – uh, as Leah said, there may be some perception by certain members of Congress that uh, accreditation is is broken, but at least when it comes to accrediting um, traditional higher education providers, we have a reasonable, uh, you know, reasonably good idea about what we're trying to accomplish there and how we might go about doing that. Um, but when it comes to non-traditional uh, online learning providers. Um, there are challenges, and, and of course, the Department of Education tried to get at some of those through its uh, EQIP pilot program. But I think um, its concept around quality assurance organizations was was fairly murky and and, and fairly hard to um, to implement. Uh, so there's, I, I think, when it comes to to addressing the differences between providers and how we have a uh, quality assurance framework that can encompass. 
the, the full range of, of higher education that's being delivered, um, there, there's still quite a ways to go. So really looking at how we are able to think about perhaps accreditation beyond just an institution to accreditation of programs by alternative providers. It sounds like that that's still a conversation that y'all think is going to be ongoing. This is, this is um, Ross, yeah, I, 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 I believe it will be, and then I'll just make a little prediction, and I think the college scorecard may not last, because that was an Obama uh, thing, and it wasn't fully supported by the Department of Education even, so that'll be interesting to see what happens to come in its place. Excellent. Well, Jarrett, this really sort of, I think, begins to move us into um, especially as we're talking about alternative providers, different pathways, and one of the reasons those are oftentimes being talked about now is the connection to increasing student affordability of higher education. So I think this sort of leads us into having you maybe talk to us for a few minutes about um, what you think the conversation is going to be over technology in this new administration, especially since there's been a, a little bit of a less than cordial relationship between the incoming administration and Silicon Valley. And how do you think that, that the technology conversations, whether it's net neutrality or privacy or accessibility, may or may not impact this larger conversation about affordability? Sure. Thanks, Van. Um, well, I think that um, – uh, before we get to some of the um, administration issues, I think it's helpful to look back at what um, the Republican leadership in Congress uh, tried to achieve in relation to um, higher education and, and related IT policy in the current Congress because, um, as you previously noted, many of the same players are going to be uh, in place uh, with the opportunity to revisit those issues, um, whether that's through a comprehensive reauthorization bill or on a piecemeal basis, as, as um, Russ mentioned. Um, so, you know, taking that uh, as a starting point, um, uh, we saw the House Education and Workforce Committee um, begin this kind of piecemeal concept around reauthorization by floating a, a few bills to address discrete issues uh, in the last Congress, and one of those was competency-based education, where um, the committee put forward its own bill for uh, competency-based education demonstration projects with an idea of getting at some of the issues we've talked about in terms of how do you um, address quality assurance for such programs, how do you think about modifying uh, federal student aid uh, laws and regulations to support um, a, a more diverse uh, set of competency-based education providers. So that's one avenue uh, for uh, facilitating in innovation. Um, on student data and, and privacy, um, we saw both uh, the House and Senate education committees get at issues around student data in, in somewhat um, different ways. Um, in the, on the Senate side, Senator Alexander's uh, majority staff on the HELP Committee floated uh, a few white papers as they started trying to flesh out what their uh, higher education reauthorization uh, pr priorities would be uh, in the current Congress. Now, obviously, they didn't get to those, but those white papers give us an indication of where Alexander might try to take the, the process now. And so one of those white papers specifically discussed um, providing students and families with uh, more information, clearer information to facilitate um, their decision making around higher education. And uh, part of the white paper, I think, um, uh, had some implicit criticism of some of the Obama administration approaches around data, which uh, Russ mentioned previously. Uh, along the same lines, uh, uh, Congresswoman Fox put forward uh, her own bill on improving uh, and simplifying higher education data for students and families. Uh, so there's uh, you know, some opportunity there uh, to see uh, uh, progress on, uh, in both chambers around that type of issue. Uh, however, 
um, the House Education Workforce Committee took a different tack uh, or a more distinct tack uh, focusing on uh, a possible rewrite of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is the primary uh, legislation that sets forth um, how institution, basically the institutional responsibility for the privacy of student education records. Um, and for my community, uh, which are higher education, IT leaders, and professionals, um, you know, there's a, a distinct concern about um, the introduction of security and breach notification provisions into FERPA for the first time. So that's something we're going to be watching for. Um, when it comes to a student aid access for alternative providers, um, the discussion on the Senate side was primarily around uh, one of the Alexander White papers on um, accreditation, where um, part of the uh, position that the white paper seemed to be advancing for public comment was how do we reframe accreditation so that it can provide effective quality assurance for a more diverse um, ecosystem of, of education providers, and, and what does that then mean for how we address federal student aid rules, which are fairly restrictive at this time in terms of how um, non-traditional providers might or might not, it would probably be a better way of putting it, get access to federal student aid. Um, finally, one of his more unique um, proposals, which has uh, gained traction um, on a, a bipartisan basis, uh, concerned the idea of institutions, quote unquote, having skin in the game when it came to student loan and student loans and student debt, with the idea being that if institutions had some uh, responsibility to absorb student loan losses if students didn't complete their education and couldn't pay back their, their student loans, that that would somehow lessen um, the uh, provision of bad student loans within higher education. I think there's a great deal of concern about how you would pursue this type of issue, particularly given um, the, the lack of flexibility institutions currently have in awarding federal student aid. So there's a lot to be discussed there, but that's still one of the major points that uh, I expect to emerge from um, Senator Alexander's help committee in the current Congress. And with all of these issues, um, the, 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 in my case, organizing framework uh, or a theme is how do these issues play into higher education affordability. And so technology gets pulled in with the discussion of how do we facilitate alternative providers who might be able to provide um, uh, learning opportunities in a more flexible and uh, more efficient fashion. Obviously, there are, there are questions around that, but that's one of the avenues. It's the how, do, how does technology facilitate affordable higher education? How does better provision of student data and more simplified provision of student data uh, to students and families facilitate more efficient provision uh, of education and so forth? Um, so that's really, I think, the, the organizing lens through which uh, we should look at any of these um, potential policy proposals. Um, now, in terms of uh, broader issues that still have uh, higher education impact, um, moving beyond the issue of student data and, and uh, student educational records privacy, um, Congress has really struggled for a number of years with how to address uh, data breach notification and cyber cybersecurity standards for facilitating the protection of what's traditionally thought of as consumer data. Um, but usually student uh, data and or uh, faculty and staff data that institutions hold get pulled under these data breach um, laws as well. So higher education has a stake in that game. Um, the uh, breakdown on this issue is both partisan and stakeholder. So from a partisan perspective, we saw proposals in the last Congress flounder um, over disagreements between Republicans and Democrats around um, uh, the, the concept of federal preemption. So the, uh, most of the bills around breach notification and, and data security standards 
uh, called for strong federal preemption, meaning that federal law would take precedence over any state laws and there would be a single national standard for breach notification and, and protecting data that would be subject to breach notification. Um, Democrats have significant concerns about that concept because in some states they view uh, the state breach notification and, and data security standards as being much stronger than what was in the federal bills that were put forward. Um, so at this point, uh, Democrats and Republicans still have to resolve that divide over how much federal law would potentially take precedence over state law. Um, then from a stakeholder perspective, um, the retail uh, services industry and the financial services industry had a disagreement and continue to have a disagreement over whether the uh, standards for security and breach notification that apply to financial services industries should be the basis for a single national standard on these issues. Um, the retail services uh, organizations tend to think that the financial services standards are um, more heavy-handed, more burdensome uh, than would be appropriate for retail operations. And so that's another divide that will have to be resolved if we're actually going to see uh, security and data breach notification legislation move forward. Um, on network neutrality, um, the, the Republicans in Congress have been very clear uh, that they uh, would like to see uh, 